It is April 1st, 2024. I am fortunate enough to be in the home of Mr. Joe Anthony, the United States Marine Corps Scout Dog Handler, 1968. And we are going to interview Joe today about his service in Vietnam. So, Joe, thank you for doing this. Welcome home. Thank you, sir. Now, when and where were you born, Joe? I was born here in uh, West Salem. Uh, my birthday is the 18th of May. And... Uh, 1946, I was born here at the old Dr. Dunn, or you used to call it KDB, Reynolds Memorial Hospital. KDB, Reynolds Memorial Hospital. It's gone now. Uh, where it's located, what's located over there now is the, uh, what do you call it? The Health Department, Ohio and Abbey. So that's where the K, uh, KDB is for you. Yes, sir. Well, they served at the time. That was what it served all the. It was, it was there's a certain blacks in Missouri. Well, speaking of that, I mean, you've seen Winston Salem change drastically in your time from birth to now. Yes, and uh, even with the turn stuff down, he, you go by one day, you see plenty of you hear a snap back, but well, that building was gone. And by me, then a halfway photographer now, I see, you know, kids nowadays, she just go out, take pictures of their, even their neighborhoods, just to see how 20 years from now, it would change on um, I wish I, it had the resources at the time when I was growing up to take pictures of all the places around and then how it has changed now. And that's schools, um, building, buildings, or grocery stores, just a, even just a corner. Stand on one corner, take a picture of what was over there. That you'll, you'll see change in 20 years. Yes, sir. So much. Well, speaking of schools, what schools did you attend here in Winston Salem growing up? Okay, I, I went to uh, I, I went to Kimberly Park and also Carver. Uh, once out in the county, and I went to Carver for about a year and a half, and uh, and I graduated from Pace. So I went to Kimberly Park, Carver, and then Pace, Pace High School. That's where I graduated from. Now, growing up in the late 40s, into the 50s, and early 60s, were the schools around here still segregated? Yes. Schools didn't segregate, schools didn't segregate here to like, I think, 64. Right in, right in there. They, they had tried it a couple of times before that. Uh, one of us, right now you wouldn't even know, but you go to East Town Elementary School. That was one of the first schools that they had integrated around here. And uh, they only had maybe five kids that they put in there for a while. And uh, at the time, I don't, I don't know, history wasn't. Uh, yeah, you, you didn't get stuff on on that TV like you do now. Yes, sir. And uh, that was one of the schools that was first. Uh, East Town Elementary. They were calling something different then. But uh, that was one of the first schools that were integrated. Now, growing up through Winston-Salem in this period, segregation in itself, what was it like growing up as an African-American in the Winston-Salem community? Well, for me, uh, it was okay for me because basically you sort of, you sort of live in a bubble. Of me, you didn't basically go as a growing up. You didn't go outside of that area unless you went downtown. To uh, they didn't have all the shopping centers around. So it's like I think the only shopping the first shopping center there was a uh, throughway. Uh, you would. 
basically uh, you stayed in your area the majority of the time, uh, except for in the summer. I live over in the, in the area they call Boston over there, Paisley High School and, and uh, Kelly Park. But the only swimming pool they had for blacks at that time that was close by was, for us, was 14th Street School. And you would actually have the, we didn't have the transportation they had around here, you didn't have the funds and catch buses and all that stuff. We had a walk. And when we had a walk, we went through areas that was actually white areas to get to on the other side of that to a, a pool where you could go swim. That's, that was the way that was. Now, growing up in this area, even through your high school years, did you see any of the civil rights movements or any of the notions with the Greensboro Four take place here? Yes. Uh, well, I you know I, I witnessed a lot of that, uh, and even when I was in high school, I graduated. Well, at one point there, they tried to get me to go to Reynolds High School, and uh, I was like, no, 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 I wasn't going. It was all it was all it was. I wasn't going, uh, and. It, and the only reason why I thought at that time, I, I played football. And uh, I thought that was part of why they were trying to get me to go. You could, you could integrate, I thought, and what I saw, you could integrate a lot through sports that you could just any other way. So a kid going to a school to play ball, and there was a lot after me. And it was right after me. Hey, went to Winter Rooms, played ball. Uh, I call them call names, but I'll tell you all. And we're not talking. Yes, sir. I tell you the names and stuff, and you say, oh, and some of them you, you probably recognize. Yes, sir. Well, not maybe you won't recognize, but you're from different areas. But people right here will recognize. Wow. Well, I mean, even through that, just seeing the, the civil rights movement, what did you see here happening in Winston-Salem? Were the protesting, any type of riots or anything? The, the riots came after I lived, basically. And, I, and, and believe me, I, I'm glad that they, in a way, that they did come after because I would have been caught up in that. And I, I know I would have been caught up in it. Sir. Which would have been not good for me for my long run. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. <laughs> well, and to continue with this, one of the what you said caught my attention is that you played football, evidently pretty good at it. Now, what position did you play? I was more than a. Yeah, go ahead. Come on, grab that real quick. No, 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 no. I'm sitting there, I'm just getting out right here. Oh. I, I played football and played quarterback, halfback. I kicked. I played and kicked off. At that time, they were, we weren't. Do a field goals at it. But I, I could keep it. <laughs> uh, I could play any position in the backfield. It didn't matter to me. I was just on one and be on the field. We did, I, uh, Pacer was a large school. We, we had maybe, maybe 40, 40 people that played ball. And uh, in a position, it didn't matter what position. I, I go, I go in there and do it. Uh, that's just the way it was. You're that one player that the coach can't get off the field. I didn't want to come off the field. I have, I have kicked off, and I played defense, 
play defensive headback, and you didn't when they can change uh, some defensive players. I go down and play linebacker. <laughs> and at the time, I weighed I weighed one hundred and sixty five pounds. So what the heck? Uh, I go down and play linebacker, but I could I could adjust. I was pretty quick on my feet. Then now it's another story, <laughs> but. I could, I could, I could do a lot of it. Play baseball. I, one time I, I was about the best pitcher in the county. Uh, and, um, we, we went to the state playoffs twice. And at the time, a lot of people were, I only, I was only in high school three years. At the time, it was, uh, 10th, 11th, 12th was high school. And that's what I did in that time. I played that time. Wow. Now, speaking as a, I played baseball and football myself. Now, as a pitcher, you know, I assume you had a pretty good fastball. Yes. How was the curveball? It was real good. I'll have him do like that quite a few times. <laughs> uh, and uh, I had a no sinker, and that was about everybody. I, 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 I never, I, I never brush anybody back. I'll say that much because I know how baseball feel, and I felt for the person. I would, I would want to do that to them. Yes, sir. And uh, I, I, I hit, I hit a guy one time in Burlington, and he, he, he was a little dude. This guy, well, I bet you he wasn't four feet. And he got up there and hurt me. Got on a little crouch, and that third pitch. I hit that kid, that kid went down. I thought he kid me. And, and I started toward the plate. Coach said, stay there, Joe. And I stopped. The guy got up. Uh, after they got him straight, he went and got on first. Coach come out and said, you all right, Joe? I said, right. yeah, I think so. But I was I walked about the next five pitches. <laughs> Coach come out there and he sort of read the right act to me. He said, Joe, man, you know, you hit the key. I know it shook you up. But now you gave you don't gave them guys all them runs. Because you, you can't pitch no more. So good. So I slowed down. We won the game, but I, I didn't like hurting people. I know what the baseball feel like. Oh, I've been there. Yeah, oh, yeah. Now, with the sports you played, baseball and football, did you consider going to college to try to pursue those sports? Really? Not really. I wasn't. I, I mean, I basically, I didn't have the funds to back me up from off of home. For me to do that. And at the time, our colleges wasn't giving that much to me. So that was it for me. I understand that. Now, through this period, outside of sports, what other hobbies did you have? Did you, you know, listen to certain types of music? Did you uh, chase girls? What did you do? <laughs> We're talking about that. You know. <laughs> that, was, that was one of the reasons, too, I didn't go to the College because I had a kid too uh, in between that. But I didn't go to college. Uh, but that's another. That's, is that for a different day for now? Oh, we can do it for now. It's up to you, Joe. Okay. It's your story. Well, I did. I ended up having a kid. And uh, I would have had to support that child and be in school too. And then, so I, I, I didn't. That was one of the reasons I didn't go to school. Well, 
being a, a father in this period at such a young age, was that frowned upon by society or did your parents support it and just make you responsible? It was frowned upon and it has also made me responsible. And that was the reason why I didn't uh, want, like I said, the reason I didn't go to college. And then I worked uh, about six months after I got out of high school and I joined the Marine Corps. Well, of all the branches, you know, because I assume by this point you've heard about Vietnam. It's ramping up. Why the Marine Corps? I was gone home. I, that just, I, I get, let's see, four brothers, four women, all of them have been in the army. And I wasn't going on. I said, and I, I did walking that long to go into walking walking that long just to go to the swimming pool. I couldn't swim that well either. So I wasn't going to the Navy. So I said with a Marine Corps. And I got in the Marine Corps and I had to swim in it that way. <laughs> they kick you, you, you if you raise your hand and say you couldn't swim, they allow you up on the pool and say, hey, who all can't swim? If you raise your hand, you got kicked in 14 feet of water. They know that at the time. But it's not. Now, you enlisted in the Marine Corps. Yes. Now, did your recruiter make any promises to you, or did they tell you that you would get this and you didn't experience that? You know, I wasn't, I did I didn't know that much about the Marine Corps. Wasn't that much out there and at the time, and I wasn't promised a lot of stuff. Um, uh, they told me that uh, I was going to have a, a rough time in there, and I did. So what the heck? I was expecting that to start with. I mean, I played, I played football, and I would tell people I would raise up in the ghetto. I I had a I had a fight out and well uh, that's another so anyway uh I wasn't prom I wasn't made any promises and I guess that's the reason why I actually survived in it. Sure. Now you enlist from Winston Salem, you go to Paris Island, South Carolina. Paris Island, South Carolina. What was your first introduction to Paris Island like? What was the process that the instructors go through when you get there. We, we, for some reason, I think they bring everybody in in the dark. And there's about eight different people outside there yelling at you. I mean, they're yelling. Get off the bus and they use all kinds of language that was they call it colorful language, but it, it would it would make uh let's see. You know, they, it, 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 it would make some of these um, coaches blush <laughs> at what they should be saying. And they I mean if they the language is tough, trust me. And the only thing I did, I, I did it. I did everything they said. And I grew up in a house that, I grew up in a house of 11 kids. My mama didn't, my mama basically was the enforcer in the house called my daddy work. And what my mama said, my mama, it went. So we had, a, had, we had to do certain things in the morning and before before school and then after, even after school we had to stuff. And uh so Marinko Marinko was just another thing to me. And they didn't bother me a bit. Now going to boot camp, of course, being a black marine, how many black marines were in your boot camp platoon? Out of 40, it may have been 15. 
15 million was there it was uh the black in it. Now were any of your struct instructors black or were they all white? They had all white instructors. Now being in Paris Island under of course Marine Corps instructors, did you see any racism or any abuse in that regard for against African Americans going through boot camp from your experience? Basically I didn't I didn't see this. But now guys have told had told me things. Right. Half the later told me that but I didn't see it. Now I've seen this. We had a, a drill instructor, his name was R. K. Tucker. And he was about five, two and a half. And he was in me. It's okay, Jeff. No, you don't. Know. He was, <laughs> you thought you thought that guy was a damn rattlesnake. You you didn't want to fool with him. I've seen him get in front. He got into this guy named was Bunch. I think guy's name was Bunch out of Newport News, Virginia. Bunch was about six, three, four. And he was just chewing like that. Cha, 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 cha. I mean, he just chewed this guy out. I mean, he went on for 15 minutes, I know. And Bunch took it all. And I, I said I said to myself later on, I said, now, I know good and well that they had taken care of Bunch in the office and told him that they were going to do that to him. Because Bunch could have killed that man. Because <laughs> I said to myself, if he had gotten in front of me like that, no telling what would happen. But that's the one. And that is, that's what is still that discipline to me. I want to tell you now, you know, I'm, 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 I'm disciplined now. You know, a lot of times I've had, I've had people get angry at me and just, just, just fall off. And I like to smell that. And because I know I'm not going to do anything to them unless they're doing something to me first. Yes, sir. So that's the way it is. It's a good mentality. Now, through boot camp, did you find any aspects of boot camp challenging? Swimming. Swimming? Swimming. Now, how long did it take you to learn how to swim? I still don't know basically how to swim right now. I say this. They call what they call life proof, uh, drown proof. <laughs> and in the water, once you hit that water, you you got you got to make sure you don't fight. And drown proofing, you get in the water, you get you strip, you take your pants off, tie knots in the, in the, in the leg, you come back to the surface like this, but you get your good cup of earth into the pants, and you float there. That's what you call drown proof. Now I can I can swim probably here and in the middle of the room and bang. But in there, you know, just say just get out there and show you a little fine strokes. <laughs> I don't have the fine strokes for that, okay. So that was the only thing. Now through boot camp, I mean your physical fitness is one of the utmost important things that you were doing, constantly on the move. But at the same time, you're learning how to be a team, not an individual. You're learning how to be a Marine. So what's that process like? It's just uh, you take care of the person next to you. That man next to you is your friend. He's your buddy. He's your lifeline. And you need Say never, never leave a man behind. And that's what you get. You, you out on a march. You that man going down. You grab an old truck. You got to side him get on too. And it happens quite more, more, more often than you realize. So basically, well, and through that, did you make a, any good friends in boot camp? Guys that you bonded up with pretty well. And, and believe it or not, I'm going to give you a name after we talk. Uh, uh, guy from right over in Clemens. Wow. But in fact, he is from Oak Brooks County. So, uh, I'll give you his last name now. Before you. Uh, but they misspelled his name. 
where he was supposed to be in, into the hymns, they put a A on the front of his name. So he ended up, we ended up being bunkmates. <laughs> they kind of found out we, we, we were so close together here in, in his area. And uh, his, his, his brothers, when I, I found out later on, I got out. His brothers ran a, uh, a auto repair business here in town. We're close to where I grew up. So, Wayne Crow's a small place. It, it, it became that way today. And uh, we, we, we still talk every now and then, but not as much as uh, with the other guy. I tell you, I grew up three doors from Yes, sir. And we called each other the first of them around the first of them all. And uh, say, hey, God, still here. And that means a lot to us. Yes, sir. It's the two of us. Too. That's awesome. It's a lot. Now, through boot camp, you finally get to the range day. Now, on the rifle range, if I'm not mistaken, you were shooting with M14s, correct? Uh, yes. Yes, M14. Then. Now, was that the first time you had ever shot a rifle? I uh, wasn't well, like that. that uh, yes. Now, how was it? It sort of intimidating first. Intimidating first. When you first get it and you feel that power in your hand and you know they talk you down, squeeze, take your breath and squeeze, breathe. And even when you're doing that, even when you know you're pulling the trigger, that's a lot of power going off in into your shoulder too. So it's it was sort of now, how did you qualify on qualification day for the range? First time I did not qualify. Oof. First time I did not qualify. And uh, but I qualified after it. But now, I always tell people, in Vietnam, I, I definitely qualified. I, and in 16, I mean, I could hit I could hit anything in front of me. Uh, it come, most of that over there, uh, it just maybe, it, it'll pop up in front of you maybe across the street. And I got to the point where just practicing, we stick those food cans about that size. And you you could be, Cross the street and throw one out like that. And I could just, within three shots, I'd have hit that thing. I got, I got down to that point. So, uh, firefights, my dog wouldn't walk us into one. But, so a lot of times when we get close to the village, you get, you get caught up. And then sometimes you wouldn't get it close to the village. The village be over here, but you get rounds coming from over there. Yeah, so I didn't, I may have gotten in maybe over there during that time, three firefighters in Vietnam. And the reason why I didn't get into them because I was causing the dog. The dog, he, he would walk into anything. Or he'll stop you, he'll turn around, he'll, he'll get in front of you, and you can push him along, you turn right back around and get in front of you again. And uh, the closest I got, and I, it was a firefight, we were going up, it was outside of Quezon, and we were, going, we were going to recover two bodies. And uh, we go over here, my dog kept crossing in front of me, back and forth. Okay, okay. And then we found a couple of little booby traps. That's okay, that's a good point, Bill. But then once we got up and top this hill, like, the hill was maybe about 
So when you got love and let the talk of the heal, it will it will level out maybe to the to maybe about twenty yards. Okay. Well you could see. And uh my dog got I me, mean, he was just kept stopping me. I said, okay, go good. And once we talked to his heel, he just turned around and locked in right in front of me. So about that time, uh, did he come up out of a hole through a chock, a chock on grenade? He threw the grenade out, and while he's in there, I just turned like this, going to the side. I went, Grr! and I went over there, was a cliff there, and a dog went over the cliff. He, well, he stopped first, and then I went on past him. And when the chack on went off, it hit him, wounded him. And uh, that's when all, all, all hell broke loose on that hill. And, and he ended up, I ended up getting my dog, found out he had gotten wounded on the, on the way down. And uh, I told him, I said, hey, they up there, boy, they was like, you know, big size thing. And uh, we walk. I carried him around, around so right around the crest of this cliff. Cause we, where we were going was a up a hill, but it was a cliff on the other side, and that's where we went over. And I carried him right around. We got back and forth. And I said, "Look," I said, "I said, look, I said, my dog is." Told so me, "Tell dog who." And uh, I said, I gotta get, I gotta get it out of here. So I started back down the hill. And she, time we got down the bottom of the hill, the helicopter was coming in, metal man. It was coming in to get him. And I uh, got him and made him be a dog. Fine, Jim. But get, we, time we got down there, they had already called metal back in. And, uh, we got on the metal van and they flew us back from the brown case on it to uh the rock pile. And then from the rock pile, we flew another chopper back to uh Don Hall. And then from Don Hall we flew to our uh, uh, C1 uh, 23, I think or 23 years old. It went on one, uh, C-130, it was like a 23. It shaked the hell out of you. <laughs> but anyway, we flew from there down to the name. And when I got to the name, the, uh, as soon as they chopped, that chopped, that plane stopped. Uh, Air Force Major and a tech sergeant. They were on there and said, where's the dog at? I said, well, I'm wrong here too. Well, I wouldn't want it, but. They, they took my dog over to the area, took care of him, and cleaned him up, got him. You know, I, I had I had done first, a little first aid on him, wait. But with that, they uh, they took care of him. It was, cause it, it, was, it was major. I, I got pictures right there. I show you. But they went in back here, come out right beside his penis. And uh, I couldn't believe it. He has had an air conditioning camera. Wow. And that's where I slept that night, in the air conditioning camera. I bet that felt good, too. I hadn't felt an air condition. Dude, Chris, I've been in, I've been in long. This, this happened August 30th of 68, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I had been over all that time. I had seen it in the office. <laughs> I slept in the kennel with my dog. Okay. That's, 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 that's. okay. You, 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 you go ahead and with you. No. With that, I mean, and, and, and this perfectly leads to the next question. So, you know, you graduate boot camp. Now, 
what was your graduation day like becoming a United States Marine? <laughs> You have that pride. That's the main thing. And, you know, I knew that the outside world was still the way it was. But being when you get that, you know you are a mom Marine. You feel you feel that pride. You hold your head a little higher. And you know that well, you, you, you feel like you can conquer the world, but you know, that's just that they, what they put in. They tear you down at first in boot camp and they put all that fight back into you and that pride, you know, you're, you're, you're a Marine and that you can do anything and you feel you can. Yes, sir. You feel like you can run through a brick wall, but. It walls hurt. <laughs> <laughs> now, outside of the fact that brick walls hurt, um, <laughs> when when you graduate, what was your MOS? Were you a O three eleven? O three eleven. And then, did you get orders right then for handler school, or did you go to no. advanced infantry training? I, I went. I went to uh, advanced infantry training, AIT, up at uh, uh, Camp Geiger. At Lejeune, and um, went there, and my order was for for Guantanamo Marine Barracks, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. I was at Marine Barracks down there, and uh, there it was. That's one of those spitting polish places. You you do a lot of grunt work because you you have to stand in the, the fence line, keep it safe. You you're with uh, you go out and stay in post from uh, it, you go from eight in the morning to eight the next morning when they leave. This is a twenty four hour thing, so you stand like four hours at a time out there, and uh, you're looking across the across the that fence into Cuba. I did it. I was down there for a year. Go ahead. Now, in your time there, did any Cuban refugees try to seek asylum um, with the Marines or try to escape anyways? So some came, some came over. Uh, in fact, they had a post right there. I, am, I personally only saw one. But how you would hear that more than that came through. But they had basically that fence line on the other side, so well guarded. And they look, they were even killed the Cubans that was coming. We were supposed to uh, detain them. Cubans on the other side got shot by the, the Cubans that were manning that fence. That part of the oh, That was one of it, it wasn't it wasn't scary because I mean we had we had we had M fourteen we had live rounds and I mean if they, if we, if we come under a threat we was authorized to shoot if they didn't obey if someone coming over and one, uh, one night there. Uh, The captain was riding, coming through to do his. Yeah, I we know who it was. We're supposed to stop him. He's he coming by check post, post, and he was listen to what I said, and I had it. I had it on the ground because I had his ass on. <laughs> but I mean, you out there to do a job, and even. Although I knew who he was, I didn't see him. You know, physically, I, I, I knew where he was and everything. But he wasn't listening to my commands. I'm the one in charge. You'll do what I say. You come in my territory, then I have to do. 
And when he hit, yeah, he got down. So, well, uh, that's your job. Even if it was the president of the United States or the highest ranking Marine general, you can't let anybody on that post. Exactly. And people don't realize that. And uh, I didn't get reprimanded for it because I was doing the right thing. I mean, I, even, the, even the guy that was backing me up, he had a bead on it too, see, now, you tell me. Now, you see, you, you come out and check me in the middle of the night, and I'm asking you, who are you, and stay where you are till I can confirm who you are. And you keep coming at me. I've done, I've done, some, I've done, some, I've done some stuff that at the time it just seemed like it shouldn't have been done, but I don't regret it in the past. Sure. Because you, 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 you kept everything safe. Sure. Safe. You had to do what you had to do. Now, did you like your posting at Guantanamo Bay or did you hate it? Did I like it? Yes, sir. Where is it? Being stationary? Yes, sir. Well, they, they had a, that's where I basically learned to swim now. <laughs> they had the best recreation down there. I mean, a big pool, pool way from our barracks, a pool way from here to that house across the street from our barracks. And anytime I had off, I would go over there. I'll be in the gym doing something. And uh, I guess that's why a lot of people at the time, you know, they got to say, I don't, I don't raise my hand in anybody. And I had people get almost too close. But that's no secret. My hands don't work too good now because of that. That's so done. Sure. Well, once again, it goes back. That's your job. It, 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 that was my job. I did. I think, well, I got, I got promoted behind me anyway because I was doing the job. Oh, oh I, I used to say, I think my wife put some of that stuff in the back room back there. Uh, I didn't give all my, uh, I got promoted from doing my job. Uh, I got promoted I got promoted to Lance Corporal, I think he coming out of Guantanamo Bay after a year in. And I got promoted Corporal as soon as I got to know. I see the Corporal there almost a year. And I got promoted to sergeant as I was leaving. Because I still had my corporal stripes on when I got to the gym. See, I had my corporal stripes on me and I had to get them, my sergeant put on out from that so I got down there. So that they promoted me leaving now. As a corporate, I ain't had a chance to get in sergeant. Well, I made a big sergeant under three years, and that don't happen also. Yes, sir. And, uh, and I'll tell you this. I wasn't staying. They offered me everything. We get another strike right now. And then I've been a staff sergeant. I said, it's strange. I said, look, wh 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 where am I going to be? Nobody was saying today. I said, it's okay. I said, I said you going to say? I said, no, I'm not saying in. They offered me, off me. Sergeant, first. I mean, I was staff sergeant first. And then they say, we'll get staff sergeant now four months. 
will give you another strike. So I've been a gun or something. But they still ain't telling me where I'm going. And I, I always kept my back to the west because I wasn't going that way no more. I was not going in there, no. I understand that. So I lived through nine and a half months walking point in Vietnam. I was not going back. Simple as that. I understand that. And I mean, especially in, I, I know it's going to come up later, of course, in this interview of where the scout dogs walk, but it is on point. And that's where you are. Yes. And that is the most dangerous job out there. Yes. Because any ambush that you walk into, you're the first one that gets sighted. But my dog wouldn't want me to. Yes, sir. And a lot of times, you, you, we hit out across the, uh, I got pictures like right there. You could, that picture, you couldn't. I couldn't work the dog there because, because of the wind. And my dog worked basically in in, in, in situations where you can get a wind around you. You get the wind coming off the ocean, all they ain't gonna do is, uh, all they ain't gonna smell is whale crap. <laughs> so let me put it on the water. And then that picture on the front of that book was on the, it was on the beach then, and it was so hot it would burn my dog's paws. So I kind of holding my toes too. Can't blame me on that one. Yeah, I'm, I'm holding my dog on. Hey, my dog got his feet cool. He ain't coming off this thing. I almost had to put him on when we got back to the area. <laughs> Well, speaking of the dog, when did you get orders for dog handler school in Fort Benton? Well, I was a, <clears throat> I was in a, what they call a casual battalion, casual company at uh, at, at, at uh, Gardner, and uh, everybody was waiting orders to go somewhere, and you know they were offering yeah, the order to come in for people to go to different places. Hmm. So when dog, when the dog school did come up, I told her I take it. Dog school's the army base. And it's Fort Benny, Georgia. That's a dog story in itself. But anyway, uh, we, uh, the orders came in, so I, I applied for them. And if I waited, if I waited four days, I may have gotten an embassy duty. But I did I come and find out that that embassy duty they weren't offering it to anybody that had not been to Vietnam. So I went to Guy Nunez, right? And I went to dog school. So I went to dog school with Ben Jordan. Now, did you grow up around dogs? Not really. So why dog school? Did it sound intriguing? Did it sound interesting? Why dog school? It just sounded okay. I knew I knew I wanted a dog later on in life, and uh, to uh, I said, well, you know, it was just something. Now, when was when did you get orders for dog school? Was this sixty six, sixty seven? When was this? Let me get it right. Yeah. It was in sixty. I got a dog, I got a little dog school in 67 in, let me get it in, in July. I had a report in August. And I went through from August to December the 10th, I think. I, I was at Fort Benny, Georgia. I came home in between, probably a couple of years, about four times in between. But uh, there was one that time, that's why I came home. Then I uh, went to Vietnam. I stayed at December, I think it was December the 10th. I got fitted up down to football. Had been, came home. And the twenty no, the thirtieth of 
the summer I was in Vietnam. Quick turnaround. Uh, yes. Now, in dog handling school, what what are some of the first trainings that you're being taught? What are you learning when you get there? First of all, to get inside a kill with the dogs. Some some of the dogs they they were killing them. Get in with them, talk to them, you know. And then you basically start working with the dog. He'll sit, stay down, walking distances and stuff back and forth. Uh, patrolling the dogs. Uh, you patrol, you set up ambushes without the dogs, and, you know, so they can, you can work yourself into it. See if the dog will alert on what's in front of you. It's awesome stuff like that. Now, what kind of dog did you start working with in the handling school? A uh, German Shepherd. What was his name? Or her name? Yeah. Uh, how could you tell me? Oh, then they did. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Just come back. Mac. Mac. He, 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 was, he was almost a brown shepherd. And I tried He, he was new. He, 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 I, had, I was the first half in reading. And I would be a dog. And the way he, Mac, and I went to see who was going to be the top panel in the class with another Marine. And this dog had been through about three sessions. And The only reason why I didn't make the top hell out of it because I had no place to take put my the stakeout chain to the dog except for around my waist and went to him. And that's how I, I did not make the top hell. Was there any reason for that? I didn't have no place to you kept your gear with you. I see Wills, that was a guy's name. The reason why I know his name so we we'll tell you about him. Uh, he never went to the he, he never went to the bush in Vietnam. Uh, he every dog he got over there, something was wrong with him. Thirteen months. Every single dog for thirteen months. Every different dog. But everybody else could come in and get that dog, train with him, go to the bush, come back. I'm sure that caused a lot of problems. A lot of animals. I bet. Yes. It was even time he was talking about talking to Frank in his in his area. You know what Frank is? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. I didn't think I did. Okay. Now, in this school, I know you mentioned it earlier, but there were 21 of y'all. 18 of y'all went to Vietnam, and you guys became a tight-knit bunch. 18 of us went to the bush. 18 went to the bush. And out of that 18, only three did not get killed all in me. Out of that 18, 15 got wounded. And you were one of the three? Now, in the school in itself, these men that you became friends with, would you be put on the same operations, or did you guys get sent all over I Corps? Well, sometimes it just depends. There's sometimes they'll call, they'll call for maybe uh, five dogs. Well, five five dogs go to a to a potato. And then there's yeah, some time maybe they'll call for uh, two dogs. And maybe just the, the two will go. It just it just depended on the need at the time or what kind of operation was coming. And see, sometimes they only have 
not ever change. You know, you you go to a, you might go to a company and you you might just work exclusively with that company, or you go and they say, well, you you gonna work with these these two companies, and they say, well, which one you go to first? They well, which one they they say they gonna take you. They take you for a while, and then you go to this one for a while. They see you back over there. Hours or tools that they used, in a sense. It wasn't it wasn't up to me where I went. But now this guy, uh, I was a, a friend of mine, we, we got to be real good, good friends. Uh, hello. He, he was out of, I think, Tumper, Texas. I have not contacted him since then, but how about uh, the two of us worked together quite a bit. We got pictures of us with two of us together. And I, well, at one time, I was the only one who could actually handle his dog. I mean, just to take the dog, walk in on him, snap, uh, snap it, put a leash on carry him somewhere else. But that dog wouldn't. Baron, Baron, Baron was a beast. I, I, now, I trust me now. See this. And they were really like I can mention them, but I saw Baron by at least five people. I mean, by him. I mean, he hit him. It's like that. And they hit at him like this, and he got that in. And he'd be back and forth on me until they got get out of range of him. Scary stuff. I'm sure it is. This, I mean, you don't you don't realize just to see a dog attack somebody how scary it is. But it was scary. Now, when Baron bit these people, were they Marines? Were they Vietnamese villagers? Were they NVA, mm -hmm. BC? Baron bite anybody. Wow. He didn't care. He look, these dogs, the dogs they train now totally different. What we the dogs they had was weapons. That's what they were, because we use those dogs to interrogate people. And, you know what I mean? You you be out and say you get a on patrol when you run up on somebody that don't supposed to be there. Well, you don't always you don't always just kill people just go they have to. You rub on up and get me walking out of bed, you know. And, you know, capture. Why are you out here? They'll give you some kind of stir. Always had interpreters. So they give you some kind of stir. And them interpreters, if they think they've been jerked around, that's when they bring the dog in. The dog would make him talk. They started singing like a canary. And I started, I saw one, one, one dog one time. It was, a, it was a jury, this guy, he wouldn't do it, and they just put the dog on. And they had this guy, it, I don't know if I can say all this. Take your time. No. This guy was tied up with, with calm one, communication one. They tied him up to a point where they, they get your hand behind your back and get you in a point where you can't stand up straight. You got to keep on being in your knees all the time. And they put that dog on the guy. And the guy, he couldn't do that. He couldn't wrestle away from nothing. That dog hit that man and squaring across. I got sick. I had to go through the bushes and throw up. I mean, I tell like I teach tell people, I said, that guy, this many years ago, I said, if that guy got any kids today, I said they he they belong to his neighbor. Mm. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. Oh, it's not a reason I'm ready to talk about it. We need to take a break. It's okay if not. I'm good. I'm good. Now, through that, I mean, mm. through these interrogations. Would any of that be written down, or that was just... Well, this this was in the bush. 
So oh, it's not even in an office, it's in the field. In the field, yes. You know, back in the office, they don't interrogate it. Don't get it. Somebody don't get their phone unless they capture them. I never send them when they get back to the bush because I don't go back with them. In the bush, you capture somebody. And you won't, you won't, and you can't, you know, so I'm you get, you get in a firefight, like, you know, and all that stuff. You, uh, uh, turn over them to interpreters, and, and they be asking them a question. I mean, you know, their town on the car, they don't care who, they didn't have zip ties, they didn't have car work. They'll tell, like I say, they'll tie your hands behind your back, and then you get your feet together. Your feet together, and they make a bend in your knees, so you had so like a little squat. You you can't stand up straight, and they question. And I was in guys like the guys who would stand right back with them for five hours. Then if they um, they think that they really hold back with their dog. Now my dog, my dog had come to me, he came to scout dogs from Century. From as being a century dog. Yes, he would attack. But he would attack on his own. And he wouldn't want to know that would just jump on anybody come back. A lot of dogs you couldn't trust. I mean, I'm no, serious. And he, anything walk past him, they'll grab him. That's how they walk. Anything. And you can't bring a dog like that back home. I know of one dog that left. No. And what it was, this guy out of Baltimore. He had gotten his leg blown off. Right below, right below the uh, knee. And he was in a hospital in Japan. And we were came down and uh, while he was there, the representative for, for, for the, his area in Baltimore, representative, came out and was talking to him and stuff. And you know, he, he knew he had he was gone back home. So he said, I said, so what do you think you're gonna miss most about being over there? He said, I'm going to miss my dog. They can't get the crate of that dog up and that dog will go. Wow. There's one or two dogs that I knew left and all, except for a puppy that Commandant came over there. Can you call Commandant? Yes, sir. He came over and they had bred. They had a female on that wasn't spade. And he used to breed her and he and they he had a they she had, had a little puppies in the but beautiful puppies. And he came over there, boy, he spotted one of them, he spotted them pups. And they were about they were about four months old, so and I guess you know he looked around like this, he said, I'm gonna take that right there with <laughs> So the commandant took one with him. Commandant gets a little say there, I guess. Uh, a little hey, he, he makes it through custom without anybody seeing anything, too. <laughs> it's so uh, great. They were, they were the only two dogs I know that left now. Well, and speaking of dogs, Mac, did Mac go to Vietnam with you, or did you get a different dog when you arrived in the country? No, Mac didn't go to the Army. The Army took him. He was that good. He he went over on an advanced party. They sent an advanced party with dogs. Matt, see, and so we were trained by Army personnel, staff sergeants, that were at Ben Hammond at Fort Benny. So when they got down to it, Matt, they took Matt from the Marines, because he had trained with me, and put him with the Army and sent him over to the Army, Army advanced unit. And they sent four dogs with guys that went out of my uniform. Now, from completing 
dog handling school to arriving in Vietnam. It's a quick turnaround. So knowing that you are bound for Westpac duty to Vietnam, what was that like in that little short respite you get at home or were those last few days for going from Vietnam? What's going through your mind? I was at home having fun. Having fun in the book. Good time to go, I live. I ain't gonna leave where I live. Now I'm not I'm not one that once I get there, I I write home a lot, you know. And in fact, I got married while I'm at home. Um, I had a kid, I got married, and uh went to Vietnam. And that was basically it. I got over there. And I don't know, I I was just like I say, I, to me, I was sort of furious. You know, I, I was sort of furious in a sense that things in the things in, it didn't it didn't matter to me. Like I say, I wanted to do things. And they be saying, go to the time you go to Bush. I never miss the time. But they say, you be, you, you be at the front gate at 6 o'clock. Or you be up at the hand of the bay at 8 o'clock. I never miss, I never miss one of them times. If they say, be there, I was there. They say, go do this, I was there. Uh, It, it get it, there's times when you get to that point where you might get a little hesitation, but you know she job. Like I say, it bought me. My job was my job, so I'm so do. Never missed the movie. And I went to the bush. I don't know nine and a half months. I might go out. Say like if I go today, I might be after ten days. I'll be back. Maybe two days. Then they said, well, we got to go all the source and go again. Or I might go, I might stay a whole month out in the bush. But the only reason why you come back a lot of time after a month, you come back because of your help of your dog, and your dog has to, that dog got checked up more than you got checked up. I'm sure it did. Yeah. Now, you arrived in Vietnam on what date? Uh, December the 30th of 67. Now, what was your first impression of Vietnam? Was it hot? No, it, it, it was December. And it was, it was, it was about like, just about like outside there now. The overcast. It was, you know, it was, uh, it, it wasn't. See, if I got over there in July, that'd be enough story. <laughs> July. From June the 15th to about the 30th of September in Maryland. And then myself. So I got there. I I had not seen any pictures of what Vietnam looked like. So that was my first thing. And when I got over there, I bought me a camera. One of the instamatic, Kodak instamatic. And they used to call it a cartridge you put in. And you shoot about 20, I think, 15, 20. Then you put on a cartridge in. Now you still have that camera? No, no, no. no I got I got a bunch of cameras. I, I got a camera that's I had before I went to get it. Wow, yeah. that's incredible. I bought it's a, it's a Polaroid. Polaroid. I see it got that it flash too for it. Can't get film for it, can't get the flash for it. So what's the hit? <laughs> but I still got it. Yeah. Now, with flying into, I assume you landed in Da Nang, and then you get off the, of course, the plane and then you go through I guess processing. Did you know that you were going to uh third military police? I knew I was going to scout dog, but what unit I did not know. Now when did when that I come along? When they were in the trench. 
the <clears throat> scout dogs was attached to 30 MP, 30 MP battalion and by I knew I was going to scout dog. So they knew when they when I got there that I had an animal stomach in. So that's how I ended up there. Now, where were they stationed at, Don Hall? What, Scott Hall? Yes, sir. Right outside the name. Right outside the name, yes. And then, so once you arrive, is a dog assigned to you? Do you have to go through any kind of in-country training? What's the process? Uh, the, the, dog, the dog is assigned to you, and you go through you, you go through some training with the dog. And uh, like I said, it, it, the dog the dog was the one that brought me home, got me back here, not me. That dog was excellent. He had been over there. When he got hit, oh, I'm right outside of case. When he got hit that day, August 3rd, 68, that was his fifth time being wounded. Fifth time. He knew what it was all about. That's why I say he wouldn't want me to It was good. Wow. Now, building up to that, the dog that was assigned to you, what was the dog's name? Mutsu. M-U-T-S-U. Mutsu. Yeah. Now. And his, his number was OB24. That was his tattoo number. His service number. Tattooed in the OB24. He gave, actually, to start with, he was a, he was trained in Japan as a sentry dog. But he, he had, the uh, Marines has a, uh, units in Japan that they walk with dogs. Yes, sir. He came from Japan to Long. Uh, and he just got to the point where he just wasn't attacking people. You know what I mean? Tired of this. But he became the craziest day going. Scout dog it was. He was. Wow. He was good. And uh, I, I'm thankful for it. And uh, that, with that dog, actually, I, I don't think, I don't think I would have been back here if I had not. Actually, I lost a lot of blanks. A lot of blanks got me. Wounded, so. Well, speaking of Mutsu, had he been wounded prior to you coming into contact with him? Yes. He had wounded August 3rd, 16. That was his fifth time being wounded. Fifth time. He knew what it was about walking from. That's why he was so cautious. We didn't get that. So he had been out there? Oh, yeah, he'd been out there. And I just could take him out. Like we had a, a rice paddy that's dry. And I uh, snap it. And okay, let's go. Yeah, I do him just like that. And he'll go out and he'll start quartering that field. If he stopped, I'll psh, 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 And he'll. It's like I could, I mean, hand signal, I mean, direct doing anything. And he'll get out there, and you see, if he get out there, and you see him hit the ground, and he ears up, you better be on the ground with your ears up too, especially out in the open. He was, oh my God, he was, he was good. Oh, it was good. So, I mean, in the training, when a dog hits the ground, what does that signify? Does that signify a booby trap? Does that signify that there is an enemy close? With this dog, when he did it in the open, then he he let you know. And he, how can I say, what's that? And he'll throw his nose up in there. And by me, it's unavailable because it's soft. But, he would. Also, he would hold it. Just go over there like that. Also, hey, it would. Also, That's right. Then he would 
do, do this. By me, always conscious of where the wind is coming from, where it's blowing, and everything. The terrain. I could, I could put you within a lot of times uh, five yards of that person, of that people, whatever it was. That's so, incredible. Well, you 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 learn your dog, and you know what your dog is doing and where you are, terrain you need. You always are conscious of the the wind, time of day. You know, if it's sun out, bright stuff like that, you always are conscious of that. And that's what kept you going, kept you alive because you know you call the wrong way every day. You got it. And he'll, he'll, he'll pick up, he'll pick up on someone before you do. And you, but you got an issue for you to relay it back to someone behind you for what he's telling you. Well, and speaking of the dog Matsu, how long did you train with him before you went out on operations in country? About three weeks. And they would set up all kinds of uh, well, scenarios out in you know, where we train in a little bush area. Yeah. It's okay. They put somebody over here and maybe put somebody directly in front of you. To throw you off trying to get that dog to do all that, to uh, alert on the wrong person that you want him to do on. It was, it was they, they set up scenarios for you to do it. You just don't go to the bush street dead where the dog was, hey, I mean, my dog, we're here to help. And you ain't done no training with that dog. Yeah, y'all let it help. You get your hand, they hurt real bad. Yes, sir. Now, when you arrive, you've got the dog. Now, what other equipment do you have that you are going to take with you into the field? Are you assigned a rifle? You get a flak jacket and everything else? You get, you get a helmet, flak jacket, uh, all the webbing, you know, you, the whole ammo, you know, ammo pouches and Canteen, and most of the time I used to carry around 12, 16 canteens of water. So you had a rucksack, I carry a rucksack. Contrails, Kernersville, VA. Got to find All right, we are uh, back from our little break here. We were talking about the equipment that you carried, Joe. Now, what specifically did you carry in the field? Okay. <clears throat> I carry the M16, and I will carry probably five clips of ammo and extra ammo. But I did have a five clips of ammo, and got a K bar. Still got it. I bought it before I went to Vietnam. I bought it back from Vietnam. Wow! Still got it right now. I showed you before I leave. That's incredible. I showed you. Oh, yeah, I got a little tattoo. We can talk about that later. <laughs> okay. But uh, I uh, carried a K bar and a pocket knife. And anyway, carried carry this pocket knife. It, uh, it was just part of, of me. And, uh, for the dog, okay, we had a had a harness which he, he worked and he knew when you want to say it went on his time when the boat work harness. And the harness, <clears throat> uh choke chain and a leash. I carried anywhere from ten to sixteen canteens of water. I uh, have, uh, have canteens at times. Uh, that, was, that was based because of the, the heat and what the dog needed. But I get all that water and stuff. And had to carry the dog food itself. Back then, they used to have these uh, 
So like a cellophane pack of food. And that you carry a dry food that you carry put in the tank, you don't have a, you don't have it in the open a can of them. Most of it was dry food. That's basically that's basically we we'll always make sure we, water was an essential thing. And also those canteens, all those canteens are here. Uh, <clears throat> we had to cross the river. Sometimes it used to be my flotation advice too. <laughs> if you know what I mean. I tell you about the swimming water. It'd be my flotation advice because I dumped that water in a heartbeat, screw it back on, stick it in it. Come on, let's go. Have my rifle across the back, this dog. <laughs> <laughs> it's just one, one of the things to do. Now, with all that, I mean, how much weight are you carrying extra uh, with all that added together, probably? Probably up to about 85 pounds at times, depending on where you are. Oof. That's, not, That's a lot. Yeah. Especially, and as you know, you mean, you, you bounce around all over i -Corps. You've got the, you've got patties and flatland, you've got rolling hills, you've got mountains. That's a lot of weight no matter what, especially in that heat. Yes. And see, it's depending on where you're going. If we were going somewhere where it wasn't any water, then I had to have a lot of them. But then we know we had streams. Basically, you know, I, I won't be down to nothing, you know, you know, canteen wise, you know, water and stuff. Because you had canteens because you never know what you're going to get. You get, you could fill them up with them when I wanted them. Yeah. Now, speaking of what you carry, this just popped into my head. Would you carry a entrenching tool as well? Uh, sometimes. So, look, if we if we took fire, my dog was an entrenching tool. He would dig a hole in a heartbeat. That's one hell of an entrenching tool. Yes, sir. He would <laughs> dig a hole in a heartbeat. Better than the E tool itself. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now, speaking of the dog and yourself, that first operation that you go on, this is what, late January, 1968, the first operation, mid, late January? Yes. And that's Tet Offensive time. That's where I went. My yeah. first operation. I was in Way. Way City. Yes. Wow. Now, do you remember what the orders were or what unit you were assigned to that first operation? I, we weren't directly in Way. We was right on the outside. But it was it was a it was a lot of fighting on that outside of it in around we we see a lot of it and uh, I like I said I can't remember all of the units I was but basically almost almost every ground unit over there at one time I was with or with there 